On my long journey playing through the entire Assassin's Creed series, we finally come to Unity, the first game to be released on a new generation of consoles and the first game that I gave up playing before completing the story. Nine years later, I now realise I was only two or three missions away from the end back then, but at least I've done it now. I wish I could say it was worth the wait, but it really wasn't. This is going to be a bit rough, so anyone who holds this as their favourite Assassin's Creed might as well start writing your hate comments now. Anyway, this is a tough one because Unity does do a fair bit right in my opinion, or at least it tries to. While I've been streaming my playthrough of the series over on Twitch, plug plug plug, people have been regularly telling me that Unity has the best parkour and the best stealth in the series. The only thing I could remember about my original playthrough was the very start when Arno is a kid and the bit where you climb the Eiffel Tower during World War II. So I took them at their word and started looking forward to experiencing the culmination of seven years of games on brand new hardware. Following the huge success of Black Flag, Ubisoft found themselves faced with following that up by producing yet another game in a series that it's fairly clear was never really supposed to go on this long. The games had been adding small but complementary new features with each new entry while improving the core systems like parkour, combat and stealth. Black Flag blew a hole in this steady progression by essentially jamming an entirely different game in there and now Ubisoft had to make something that felt like the next generation of a franchise which suddenly found itself quite boat centric. Faced with this daunting task, they did what any good IP owners do when their creation gets out of their control. They made a soft reboot and attempted to address the concerns of the more vocal areas of the fanbase. What we're left with feels somewhat similar to the older games, but different enough to arguably be an entirely different game. Kinda like a Souls-like made by a company that isn't FromSoft. I can't believe it took them seven years to introduce a crouch button to their stealth game. But it did, and now we can finally crouch down to better hide from guards. There's now also a dedicated button to attach us to cover, which also allows us to move along walls and such while still staying out of sight. Or at least it sometimes allows this. More than a couple of times I found myself attached to a wall unable to move in one direction, despite there being plenty of unobstructed wall that way. I could move the other way though, but that's not what I wanted to do. You can also move between bits of cover, but not all the time, and it felt extremely arbitrary as to when I could and couldn't do this, and I often ended up just leaving cover and crouch walking my way over there. Which is fine, except for the transition between these two animations involves Arno stood bolt upright and directly in sight of enemies. While I'm glad they finally added crouching, it apparently comes at the expense of whistling to lure guards over to your position. A feature originally introduced in Black Flag and was so good that they retroactively added it into AC3 and Liberation in their remaster. Once again, Assassin's Creed giveth and Assassin's Creed taketh away. Freerunning has had some changes made to it and now has two extra buttons to consider, one to climb up and another to climb down, potentially eliminating the chances of running up walls when you actually want to drop down to street level. This also eliminates the situation from previous games when your only real option to get down to the street in a hurry is to either leap off and hope you can tank the full damage or find a flock of birds that indicate a bale of hay. Here though you can scramble down building sides fairly quickly and fluidly, getting you back down to street level without losing any health and still keeping some momentum too, or while looking pretty darn dapper while you're at it. One of the many new features in Assassin's Creed 3 was building interiors that we could pass through with our parkour powers. These were incredibly limited and essentially just mini cutscenes showing Connor slide under a table and through a window or whatever it was. It's something I barely found myself doing and I can't even recall whether it was included in any of the games after that. Here though we get so many open windows we can burst through and run out the other side, but we are in control the entire time. Hell, you could even decide to stop and run down the stairs and into the street rather than just leaping out the other side. This is great, and it feels great, as long as there isn't too much furniture in the way. 
Otherwise, you're likely going to get stuck on it, and that cool AC Unity parkour TikTok video you're making will have to wait a bit longer until you find a more reliable route to record. I've talked about this before on my streams, but I really feel that the more options we have for free running increases the amount of mistakes that can happen, and that seems to be on show in spades here. More so in this game than any other so far did I find myself talking to the screen as if I were trying to train a dog, encouraging Arno to jump up, come on, up, up you go to a ledge that he doesn't quite seem sure about, or loudly berating him for not climbing down, get down, get down, despite being shot at by guards and his target rapidly fleeing down the street. The combat system here is very different from any other game in the series up until this point, though still rooted in parrying enemy attacks. Medicine returns from the Ezio trilogy, replacing the regenerating health outside of combat. Enemies have health bars displayed above their heads, and these will glow red when they start attacking and will transition through to bright yellow just as they are about to hit you. If you hit the parry button while it's yellow, you'll pull off a perfect parry, leaving them wide open for a string of counter-attacks. You can also imperfectly parry them if you don't quite get the timing right, and other than the little point counter showing up, I couldn't tell the difference between a perfect and an imperfect parry. You can also roll out of the way of some heavy attacks, which have their own glowing red box to signify them, and the same goes for people trying to shoot you. People throwing knives doesn't seem to give any indication that they're about to attack though, unless I'm missing something, so these just seem to operate as a sort of health tax every now and again. Whittle an enemy down to zero health and they'll stagger around for a few seconds before falling down dead. During this time you can perform an execution move, which are just as gloriously brutal as in previous games, except now with more detailed graphical gore. There's no tactical advantage to this, it just gives you something cool to look at and it gets you some more of those points that I mentioned. I don't mind this combat system, but for the record I was never displeased with the previous system. As I mentioned in a previous video, just because something is easy doesn't mean it isn't satisfying. While this new combat system did take me a little while to get the hang of, I do appreciate what it's going for. Black Flag was a little ridiculous in that it was fairly easy for a cocky sailor from Swansea to wipe out an entire ship's crew single-handedly. However, I personally think that Ubisoft's attempt to rebalance this was not the way to go. This is the first game in the series to give your character a level, represented by up to 5 pips. This is also true for enemies and missions themselves. The more pips, the higher the difficulty. This means that one enemy wearing an official uniform may have 2 pips and his mate wearing the exact same uniform has 5, meaning that the latter is able to take significantly more sword slashes to the face before dying. Though if you are also at level 5 then the difference will be negligible, but at lower levels this often leaves your best option to be to run away. Again, I'm okay with this in principle, but just dress them up in heavy armour or something, please? At least make it look feasible that these guys can take a much heavier beating before falling over. You increase your own level by purchasing better gear and weapons. I do very much appreciate the variety of weapon types on offer here, especially after Black Flag limited our options so heavily compared to other games. What I don't appreciate is that one entire class of weapon is locked behind DLC, and the sheer number of weapons and armour pieces. I mean seriously, look at how many different hoods I can purchase or unlock. Same goes for gloves, trousers, belts. This quickly brought up the issue of making Arno look like a bit of a twat because those items had the best stats. You can equip outfits that change the appearance while keeping the benefits of the equipment, but there shouldn't be this many options. And the difference between two pieces can be so negligible that it's usually barely worth swapping out the older gear. But again, this in itself isn't what irked me about the system. Fashion options are fine and great, and I can ignore them if I'm not interested, but I do need some higher level gear if I want to be leveled enough to take on later missions and enemies. The big issue is the prohibitively expensive cost of these items. Unity does not shower you in cash like previous games. Chests may contain a few hundred francs or whatever they are, and some missions will start giving you rewards in the four figure range, but with single pieces of high end armour costing in the hundreds of thousands, you've got some grinding to do to push those level pips up. Now again, 
In fairness, missions also regularly reward you with appropriately leveled gear, but you will have to purchase items yourself if you want to get up to level 5. The last few missions in the game are full, and I mean to the point of taking the piss, full of level 5 enemies. More than four of these would leave me just standing there waiting for death so I can try again and hope I don't get spotted. You will need to earn some money to buy that better gear, especially if you care about how ridiculous Arno looks while trying to blend in with a crowd of rowdy peasants. Just a quick example of how long it can take to grind up the money you need, fairly early on you are given control of a cafe to run. Much like Ezio's villa, you can upgrade this in stages to increase your regular income from it. Each upgrade increases in cost, with the final one costing 15,000 livres. Your regular income from all of this heavy investment? 380 livres every half an hour or so. But don't worry, don't worry, you don't have to just use livres to buy gear. Remember those points I mentioned earlier? You get those whenever you perform what they call assassin moves, like executions, stealth kills, air assassinations, stuff like that. These points can be used to upgrade equipment, which usually just makes them 25% better. One could argue that 25% increased mediocrity is still mediocre, but that might be all you can afford at this point. Of course, there's always helix points, but these could honestly fuck off and die along with every other paid for in-game currency on the planet. You get a few through early mission rewards, usually enough to buy you one or two things, then that's it, they stop coming. My understanding is that Helix points stick around for the rest of the series, but I'm hoping I can ignore them as easily as I did here. I do remember when I played on PS4 at launch that certain chests would require me to sign up to a mobile app or something like that, which has thankfully been removed here, and I was hoping that the Helix points had too. You can of course avoid them completely, but during the last couple of missions I was left wondering whether I would be having more fun if I had the better equipment that was locked behind a high cost that was put in place purely to make the microtransactions more attractive. Shadow of War had a microtransaction system that required the endgame to be rebalanced when they removed it, but I don't think a simple rebalancing of the gear system would fix my problems with Unity. When the parkour and combat work, they work well and they look superb. I mean, I regularly see parkour runs pop up on YouTube shorts and they really do look amazing. Thing is, they just as frequently don't work and you get stuck on a ledge and shot. During combat, the camera will regularly position itself where you can't see the parry indicators or the gunshot warnings, so you're just left guessing as to when that bullet is going to be flying at you. And I personally did not find the stealth satisfying at all. Crouch is nice, and pinning yourself to a corner to take out patrolling guards is as fun as it is anywhere else, but moving between cover just did not work reliably enough for me to consider using it. It's these features, these core features of the game, feel that they could have done with another year or so in the oven. And they had the perfect excuse to do that. Rogue came out on the exact same day as this, and that's almost as big of a game as Black Flag. They could have pushed that out cross-generation, just like a Black Flag, and leave Unity to be fine-tuned and perfected before pushing it out the door. But instead, they released them both simultaneously, leading to disappointing sales for Rogue because it was on quote old consoles, and led to a famously buggy game that just wasn't ready to be released. All of those terrifying skinless faces that everyone remembers are gone now, and the issues that remain are the things that could have been ironed out if they'd just been given the time to do so. Another new addition to the series is a skill tree, with skill points being given out as mission rewards. As a quick side note, these are listed in a way that suggests you earned, for example, 2 out of 2 points, with the implication being that I could have only earned 1. After not completing any optional objectives, I was still always awarded with the full amount of points. What do I have to do to earn less than the maximum? Is it even possible? Anyway, anyway, skill points are another feature that I don't have an issue with in theory, but there are some very questionable applications here. First off, it's important to note that I did not earn enough points during my playthrough to unlock every skill. This is important because I have to spend one of those points on the ability to sit on a bench. 
all of that armor gear I talked about earlier also allows you to increase your carry capacity of medicine or ammo or whatever, something I admittedly didn't realize until the second to last mission. However, armor doesn't increase your health, it only increases your resistance to damage, which kind of makes sense, but this means that your health is increased by you buying skills. There's also skills for doing more damage with different weapon types, which again I feel should come from the items themselves, but at least the lockpicking skills made a bit of sense to me. There are a few co-op focused skills too, but obviously I didn't bother with any of those because I have no friends and will die alone. Unity carries over the usual assortment of ranged weapons too, with berserk darts and different types of bombs and such, and these all work fine, but I do feel like the range of the guns and darts was a little bit too short, but maybe that's just me. Eagle Vision has also been tweaked to be a much more localised event and only works for a few seconds before it needs to cool down again, and tagging enemies has been removed for some daft reason. Arno also can't whistle here, which I know I've already mentioned, but Jesus Christ, that's such a stupid thing not to include. It's almost as bad as saying they couldn't include female co-op characters because that would mean creating new sets of animations. Which is funny because I'm pretty sure Cassandra and Alexios have the exact same animations for everything they do. In terms of gameplay, I think this just about covers all of my issues with the game. The parkour can look incredible, but isn't reliable. The new stealth mechanics are so iffy I eventually gave upon them entirely, and the combat generally works well until the enemy levels and the camera start playing against you. There's plenty of things to not like here, and I haven't even got to the story yet. I think it's fair to say that it's painfully obvious that Ubisoft had zero plans with how to keep the modern day story going after Desmond saved the world. And while Black Flag teased a new story thread involving Juno, Rogue very much felt like stalling for time. With Unity, they go back to the liberation approach, which is to have us take on the role of a video game player playing an Abstergo console. We were supposed to be playing a game about some 14th century French Templar, but our game is quickly hijacked by the assassins who want to show us just how bad the Templars really are and convince us to join their fight against them. They do this by making us play through a story about a man who spends most of his time helping Templars and having very little to do with the assassins themselves. Also there's a revolution going on, but we don't talk about that. After a quick tour of medieval France, which is oddly populated with people whose accents range from all across the British Isles. Who goes there? A friend of the temple. Flaurac, the council's message was absolute. You're not welcome here. I must speak with the Grand Master. He's in session. They all are. Another day, perhaps. I'm French! Why do you think I have this outrageous accent, you silly king? We're dropped into the shoes of Arno Dorian just as his dad is killed by Shay Cormac from Rogue. Turns out Papa Dorian is an assassin, but obviously Arno doesn't know this yet, and he's taken in by the father of a girl he just met and raised as a worker in his big house. Arno and the girl, Elise, spend their lives in a secret relationship with each other, as a lady of status cannot be seen cavorting with the help, you know. At a big party, Arno witnesses her dad being killed, which he is then framed for and thrown in prison. While in there, Arno ends up accidentally revealing that he has eagle vision, which another prisoner recognises and starts training Arno how to fight. Turns out this chap's an assassin too, and when the Bastille gets stormed, as it's prone to do, they make their escape and he urges Arno to join his brotherhood. At this point, Paris is now in full revolution mode, and the assassins are keen to keep an eye on what the Templars are up to. As it happens, Elise's dad was the Templar Grand Master, and now a new one has taken his place and is making drastic changes. This obviously needs some attention, which Arno sees as compatible with his desire to solve this murder mystery. And that's basically it. The assassins are well established and doing just fine in their fancy underground lair. France is tearing itself apart, but that has no impact on the story whatsoever, and Arno is literally just there to solve a murder. Before the end of the game, he is kicked out of the order for killing people without clearance, so we end the game having our assassin status removed due to not wanting to follow the creed. Makes the title seem a little bit like false advertising. I'll be honest, it was almost almost refreshing to see a story where the assassins seem pretty comfortable with their current situation and instead have the Templars screwing each other over. 
That said, one assassin does betray the others in the name of rebuilding the Order, which is exactly what's happening with the Templars, but it comes out of nowhere and it felt like they just wanted to create some drama for a little bit. It was also an excuse for a fairly cinematic, if overly tedious, boss fight sequence. Arno spends most of his time pissing off the assassins and helping out his Templar girlfriend. So other than his dad having been an assassin and that one chap he was in prison with telling him he should, I'm not sure why he joined them over the Templars. The ideologies of either group is not explored at all here and there is absolutely zero First Civilization content until the very last boss fight. And even then, it's just a sword that shoots lightning. I mean, the head Templar is revealed to be a sage, but nothing comes from that and it feels like they just added that in to keep us interested enough to carry on with the story. Which I guess works because I actually finished the game this time. The French Revolution, a setting people had been wishing for since Assassin's Creed 2, is wasted here in terms of story. It's never really talked about, it doesn't directly affect any characters or any story beats, and it feels like it was just included as an excuse to show off how many people they can put on screen at once now. That said, it is very impressive how many people they can put on screen at once now, and how much is going on at any one time. Even towards the end of my time with the game, I was spotting new goings on amongst the NPCs. Paris is a great city to explore when the parkour is behaving, and the masses parading severed heads, burning effigies, and setting up guillotines really adds to the spectacle. I do wish the background elements were rendered a little bit better. Even on my highest graphic settings, any buildings in the middle distance and beyond have textures looking more like PS1 games. Or maybe I'm missing a key graphics setting that fixes this, I'm not sure. Fast travel operates the same as Black Flag in that you travel between synchronised viewpoints. However, viewpoints are fewer and farther between, with only one per district of the city. There are little activities that pop up as you wander the streets, like tackling thieves or killing criminals, and while these do start to get a little bit repetitive, they're quick and easy to do, and completing enough of them does reward you with some free gear early on. A new feature I absolutely love in this game though are the big assassination missions. These are kind of like more restricted Hitman levels, in that you have a few options in how you approach your kill. I've been wanting this sort of thing since the first game in 2007, and now it's finally available. Arno has some superior sight and hearing, and so can hear if people have stolen some keys, or if a guard is going on a break, or whatever. The first example for this is in Notre Dame, where a Templar chap is being chauffeured around before attending a secret dastardly meeting in a confession booth. You can take out the guy he was meeting and take his place before lying in wait to assassinate your target in secret. Or you can just sprint past the guard, stab him and then run off again afterwards. It's up to you. Other examples provide multiple points of entry to restricted areas, side objectives to create new opportunities and distractions to help you escape. I've been wanting these sorts of options for a long time, and I really hope these get expanded on as the series progresses. Assassinations also bring up a couple of extra changes from previous games. The often mocked confession scenes from previous games are no more. Arno is apparently some sort of psychic and can view the memories of whoever's neck his blade is currently in. Honestly, I think this makes more sense in terms of fitting in with the world, as I was often wondering what the hordes of guards chasing me are doing while I have an extended chat with their dying boss. But it's a new feature in an established world, and it's not discussed or even questioned. Arno provides the information he learns through these visions as evidence to others, and no one questions how he could know this stuff. It just seems a bit odd. Also, the Hidden Blade is now a contextual action, rather than a weapon you can equip, and you can only properly assassinate a target with it. This can be a problem if you are in open combat with your target and their guards, as you may press the button intending to finish him off, but that other guard is also close to you, so Arno may instead swing his sword at him. It's an odd decision here, which seems needless, frankly. Plus, I quite enjoy fighting people using the Hidden Blade, there's usually some cool animations for it. With Black Flag being the success that it was, and with this being the first next-gen Assassin's Creed game, Ubisoft clearly felt that they had to make some significant changes to the core systems to give it the impact they wanted. 
New hardware gives them the opportunity to address some of the long-running complaints about the series, with arguably the combat and the free-running being the most common nitpicks from vocal players, and they also looked to expand the gameplay with slightly open-ended missions. Again, I feel the reason it failed to really hit these goals is that it was rushed out of the door to keep up with the yearly release cycle. Given another year, we could have ended up with a much tighter and more satisfying game. I am fully supportive of what they were going for in this game and those highlights regularly shine through, but it just as regularly doesn't work and the game is shown for the rushed product that it is and had an undeniably drastic effect on the future of the series. Which brings me to my running ranking of the series. I was hoping that this game might hit differently nine years later, but it just doesn't. And if anything, its flaws are more obvious having played through the previous games again. This one has to go at the bottom of my list because I have no desire to play through this game again at all. While I did have fun at times, the mechanical failings and the difficulty spikes that result from the unbalanced leveling system would have made me give up again if not for the fact that I'm making these videos. I genuinely hoped that I could see what other people had been telling me about this game, but I just can't and this is the first game I can honestly say I have zero intention of ever coming back to. Except now there's apparently this mod that fixes these issues, so maybe I will at some point. So on that low sorry note, it's now time to look forward to Syndicate, the last of the classic Assassin's Creed games and the first mainline game in the series that I have never played. Once again, I'm streaming my playthrough over on Twitch and I look forward to all the Unity fans giving me shit for not liking their game. I took a fair bit of abuse while I was playing through the game, so I'm ready to stay polite and friendly while being berated and insulted, so pop on over and give me what you've got. Or you can let me know in the comments, whatever you prefer. Into the river. Oh, that was different, they beat me at whist. I can see it now. We'll call ourselves the Rooks. <laughs>